All right. For those of y'all at home, they've been given time to copy this slide, so pause the video and copy the slide. If you haven't finished copying, please stop. I'd really rather, I mean, this is gonna be up. You're, you're, I'm gonna end before the bell, so you'll have time to finish copying. But um, hey, we finally get to change gears a little bit and ask the question, what is chemistry? I haven't asked that question yet. The very easy answer to what is chemistry is, it's this, it's the study of matter. By the way, please put away electronics. I see devices out that are puzzling. All the way away, all the way gone, disappear. I appreciate it, thank you. Um, chemistry is the study of matter. The only thing that we'll talk about over the next nine months in here is items that are matter. So let's first define, okay, well, what the heck is matter then? What will we be talking about in the course? By definition, a sample that's matter is anything that has two qualifiers, all right? It has to be something that I'm holding that has two things about it. First, it has to have mass. We have to be able to get a numerical weight of it. Secondly, it has to have volume. What does it mean if it's got volume? It means it takes up space. It's got to take up space. Here's the thing about this lecture. This is the only slide. There's no more slides coming. All right, that's my checklist of things to get through. This whole lecture is a lecture of examples. All right, you have the definitions, and the definitions are great. It's what I need you to know. But I'm going to go through a ton of examples today. The most successful students are the ones that have those examples written down. Because when you go to Schoology, the definitions are great, but my examples give you total clarity. So as I'm going through it, Jot them down. Oh yeah, he said this, he said this. All right, it'll help you out tremendously. So keep that writing utensil up. Let's talk about what is matter. Here's an example of something. You tell me if you think it's matter or not. The desk. Does this desk have mass? It does, I can move it because I'm super strong. Does the desk take up space? It does, look, it's impeding my motion forward. All right, go. Don't look. Who's coming next? Uh, yes, it absolutely takes up space. So the desk is an example of matter. What about me and you? What about humans? Do I have mass? Yeah, yeah I've got mass, right? A ton of mass. Stop eating so much, Um, Do I take up space? Humans, living things, are matter. What about the light in the room? The light that is illuminating the room. Is it matter? Does light take up space? It's good that it doesn't take up space because there's so much of it around us that when we're walking around, we keep running into it, and that would get really annoying. Does light have mass? It doesn't. It doesn't. It carries energy, which is why some of y'all get, oh, but I know it's got something. All right. But it doesn't have mass. Otherwise, it would be weighing me down. Let's draw some cards. Yeah. Aspen is in play over there in cluster one. It's real simple. I'm going to give an example and you say it is matter or it's not. Here we go. Let's go over to cluster six for starters. Cluster six, seat four. Four. It found you, Alejandra. Here's my example. You ready? A pile of dead puppies. It is matter, right? Remember, we I, was show, I showed you all the dead puppies in the closet. What? Yeah. Dead puppies take up space, right? Mostly in our hearts, and they absolutely have mass. I know that because I have to carry them to the back of the truck. Let's do another. What is that? Let's do another one. Let's go over to cluster six again. Seat two. Hey, six two. Sound. Is sound matter? No. Sound is not matter. Sound doesn't take up space. All right, I can't scream and throw you to the ground. And sound doesn't have mass, all right? Now, again, sound, like light, carries energy. What class studies non-matter? This class studies matter. There's another class that studies non-matter, which is 
It's physics. That's what physics is. All right. You might be taking it next year. I'm going to try to talk you out of it because you don't need physics to graduate. Yeah. You don't. Um, so we'll talk about that second semester when choice cards come out. But um, let's do one more before we move on. Here we go. Let's go over to cluster five. We're staying in the back of the room. Cluster five, seat six, Aspen. Water. Is water matter? Do you agree that yes, waters matter? It absolutely is. All right. Water has mass. Water takes up space. Are there any questions on how I'm doing this? All right. So then in chemistry, we take these different samples and we can do a bunch of stuff to them, study them in a bunch of different ways. So let's start those bunch of different ways. The first thing we can do is classify it. We can say that this sample of matter that I'm holding is either pure or not pure. If it's pure, it means that it cannot be broken down. All right, by the way, if you didn't write down water or sound or any of those examples, congrats on doing school wrong. Do better. What? Well, yeah, in all caps, please. Um, a pure substance is one that cannot be separated into anything else. And if you decide that a sample of matter is pure, then it's one of two things. So it's like classification, we're breaking down a system. If it's pure, then it's either an element or a compound. I'm reading right out of your notes here, you already wrote it. An element or a compound. Where do the elements live? If something's an element, where can you find it? Right up there. Every single element that we know of is on that periodic table, all right? So if you look up here, if I give you a sample of something and I say, is it an element? Then you just look at your table. If you can find it, yep. If you can't, no. Those are all the elements and all of the elements are pure. They cannot be simplified or broken down into smaller pieces. All right, so we're still talking about pure. It can be an element or it can be a compound. Now, in parentheses here, you defined compound. Uh, it's, it's elements that have been married together. So to be a compound, it's anytime you have multiple elements that are loving on each other. All right, bonded is the real word. But remember, pure substances like compounds cannot be simplified or broken down. Like, let's take water, for example. What is water made of? Hydrogen and oxygen, all right? A couple of hydrogens and an oxygen. So that's multiple elements that have been put together to make a compound. I'm telling you that water is a pure substance. It can't be physically broken down into smaller pieces. So if I take some of this water and I pour it right here, ooh. And I asked one of y'all to come up here and separate the H's from the O's. You would look so stupid trying to figure it out. All right? Because you can't physically, I got it on my computer. You can't physically separate them into smaller parts. Now, anybody know what the opposite of physically separating it though is? If you're, yeah, you can chemically separated, but the whole idea of doing a chemical reaction to separate them has no bearing on our classification of being pure. I'm sorry? We'll, we'll get into it when we study reactions. We have a whole reaction to it. I mean, you can electrocute water and it separates it. All right. So let's remember, let's rewind. Where are we? We know what matter is. We know that one of the classifications of it is pure, in which case it can be a element or compound. But what if it's not pure? If it's not pure, then it's a mixture. It's just items that have been mixed together. And the big difference there is that mixtures can be separated. The pure substances can't. But if you say, hey, this piece of matter is a mixture of stuff, it means you can take that stuff and separate it into 
its components. But then to make things annoying, there's two types of mixtures. We already wrote them down. But let's talk about what the heck they are. The first one is a homogenous mixture. Focus in so you can get this. I have a desk in between me and it. A homogenous mixture is one where you take these parts and you mix them together. And when you do, the parts kind of disappear visibly. They blend into one another. When the mixture is formed, you can't necessarily see the different things. Instead, it all looks the same throughout. It looks uniform. A good example of a homogenous mixture is Kool-Aid. Are there any Kool-Aid fans in here? Yeah, we love our Kool-Aid. What do you need? What does it take to make Kool-Aid? Sugar, water, and the oh yeah powder, right? Mix those together and you've got yourself some Kool-Aid. But shh, shh, once you do mix them together, you don't look at the jug and be like, oh, look, there's the water and there's the sugar over there. No, it just it's beautiful red liquid, right? To the point where, as long as you don't suck at making Kool-Aid, if I were to take a jug of Kool-Aid and pour all of you a glass out of it, it should all taste what? The same. It should all taste the same, even though it's a mixture of things. Because homogenous means that it is the same throughout once mixed. So I bet you can guess what a heterogeneous is then, right? Hetero meaning different. A heterogeneous mixture will be one where when you mix the stuff together, you can still identify those parts. You can still see them in there, the different parts, because there's different amounts of different stuff in different areas. Our classical example of a heterogeneous mixture is Chex Mix. Any Chex Mix fans in here, yeah? Got the delicious Chex, the good little crouton things, then you have the pretzels that make you want to hurt yourself. I hate the pretzels. Chex Mix, when created, you can easily identify all of those things just by looking at it, right? Way different than the Kool-Aid. And if I were to take a bag of Chex Mix and put a different pile on each one of y'all's desks, what would be true about the piles compared to each other? They'd all be different. You'd have more Chex here, you'd have more, uh, more awful, awful pretzels there. You'd all have different amounts of different stuff because that is a heterogeneous mixture. Now, remember, what makes a mixture a mixture is the fact that it can be separated into its parts. Can you unmix the Chex Mix? Yeah. Easy, right? Just pull it into its piles. Can you unmix the Kool-Aid? Physically, yes. First off, the answer, I, I got you. The answer has to be yes, because I told you that all mixtures can be separated, and Kool-Aid's a mixture, so the answer has to be yes. But how do you do it? How do you unmake Kool-Aid? Boil it. Boil it off. Boil off all the liquid, and you'll be left with those two powders that are mixed together. Now, separating them is a bit more tricky, but there's a filtration process that we could use to do it. Question. It, that, that, will be a, that will be a solution. That will be homogenous. It's going to dissolve evenly in that case. Yeah. Uh, in which, oh, uh, with the cotton candy? Yeah. The what? So technically that is still a mixture that can be separated, but that is a tough separation. All right, but as far as definitionally goes, the answer is yes. Speaking of practice, let's practice. You ready to draw some cards? Nope. Let's do it. Here we go. Ready your brain. Hey, when I call on you, your options are element, compound, homogenous, or heterogeneous. Here we go. Let's go over to cluster three. 
and talk to seat one. Hey, three, one. Here you go. Remember, only the person I call on is allowed to speak. Here we go. Rocky Road ice cream. Element, compound, homogenous, heterogeneous. Rocky Road ice cream. Don't look around. Don't look at her. Heterogeneous is correct. Yeah, it's heterogeneous because if you look at Rocky Road ice cream, you can see the ice cream, you can see the marshmallows, you can see the uh, the, the almonds or whatever it is. All right, it's got different amounts of different stuff and they're easily identifiable. Let's do another one. Let's go over to cluster six. C6, Aspen. Here we go, ready Aspen? Flory. Flory. Element, compound, homogenous, heterogeneous. Flory. I'm sorry. The guess is compound. Agree or disagree? What do y'all think it is? Yeah, he's got his own square. Fluorine has his own square, and those are the elements. So, hey, fluorine is a pure substance, right? Let's do another one. Let's go over to cluster two and talk to seat two. Hey, two, two. Ketchup. Ketchup. Element, compound, homogenous, heterogeneous. Quiet, please. The guess is homogenous mixture. Do you agree or disagree? Perfect, right? To make ketchup, you have to mix tomatoes, vinegar, preservative, sugar. But when you dump it out of the bottle, you don't see those things. You just see wonderful, bloody liquid like the dead puppies. A, a compound is going to be just elements bonded together, while a homogenous mixture will be different things mixed together that can be separated. The compound can't be separated. Let's do one more. Let's go over to cluster five and talk to seat one. Hey, five one, here we go. Table salt, also known as sodium chloride. Compound is correct because it's sodium and chlorine, two different squares from the table mixed together. We good? Cool. That makes us halfway through. So we've talked about what is matter and we've talked about how to classify it. Let's talk about once we have a sample of matter, what can we do to it. We can change it in different ways, and there's two main ways that you were first introduced to in first grade, so welcome back to this terminology. This is very simple. A physical versus chemical change. A physical change is one where after the change, there's no new substances. For example, all right, if I were to have if I were to have this beautiful sheet of purple paper, watch this, watch this, you ready? I'm about to blow your mind. Crazy. I should probably retire. All downhill from here. Did I change the paper? Quit, quit saying what you think I want to hear. Did I change the paper? Yes, ripping paper in half is changing it. Right? Go rip a $100 bill in half and see if the bank thinks you changed that bill. You did. They're not going to take it now. All right? Yes, I changed it. But is there anything new? No. Don't have anything new. I started with paper. I ended with paper. The change was that I just tore it in half. Let's see if we can introduce a different change. All right? So... Let's change it a different way. You want another fire drill today? All right. Everybody catch it. I changed the paper again. Is there anything new? What is the new item? Ash. We created ash, which is something that we did not have before. If something new is created, then it's chemical. 
Let's draw some cards. Don't throw paper at each other. I appreciate it. Here we go. Ready? Your choices this time are smaller. Physical or chemical change. Let's go talk to people. Let's go over to cluster one and talk to seat four. A14 to you and me again. Ready? See my glass container here? It made me mad. So I took my glass container and I threw it on the ground. But you, man, I bet I can't do that again. Let's see. Put it on the ground. Burst it into a million pieces. Physical or chemical? It says physical. Agree or disagree? Yes. Breaking glass, of course, is physical. Let's do another one. What, I mean, have you met me? Cool is kind of just pouring out of my ears. Here we go. Let's go over to cluster tree and talk to seat three. Hey, three, three, you ready? Baking a cake. He says chemical. Do you agree? Yeah. Add this to your notes. Cooking is always chemical. Cooking is always a chemical change. Favorite class in high school? Baseball. <laughs> Wow. I don't know. I like the English because I like to write. But. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's go over to cluster five and talk to seat four. Aspen, it's you. You ready? Ice melting. The guess is chemical. Agree or disagree? It's funny. If I stare at you long enough, you will question yourself. Y'all, ice melting tricks you. So let's talk about what it is. You're starting with cold water and ending with room temperature water. It is a physical change. Add this to your notes. Phase changes are physical changes. Phase changes are physical. I've only recorded, this is only the second time. I recorded measurement one and measurement two. Y'all weren't here for that. All right, here we go. Let's do one more. Let's go over to cluster five. Seat five, Aspen, ready? Photosynthesis. The guess is chemical, agree or disagree? Yeah, like by definition, right? Photosynthesis is turning our uh, wonderful CO2 into what two things? Oxygen and? And sugar, glucose. We're not studying photosynthesis, but kudos to biology. We doing all right? Y'all, my last two, and there's actually a bonus one, so sorry, but my last two here are the hardest to understand. So, thank you. So if there's a time to refocus your brain, it's now. Extensive versus intensive is what we do to a sample of matter in regard to categorizing its adjectives. Now, I know that was like, what? Intensive and extensive takes a list of properties, the way that you would describe this sample of matter, and it categorizes the descriptions themselves, the adjectives that you would use to describe the sample of matter. Now, this will make a lot more sense when I give you examples, but what, here's what you wrote down. If it's extensive, then the description changes if the amount of your matter changes, and intensive doesn't change. What the heck does that mean? Let's examine. Look at that. Check it out. Hey, piece of yellow paper. Is, uh, is the paper an example of matter? It's got mass and volume. It's matter. We can physically change it. We can chemically change it. We can talk about whether it's pure or a mixture. We can do all that fun matter stuff. What I want to know, though, is if I start describing it, how would you categorize my descriptions as intensive or extensive? And both will exist. Here we go. I'm going to describe it, and let's see which one it is. I'm going to describe this paper's mass. Let's say it's 0.5 grams. The paper is 0.5 grams. I want to know if its mass 
is extensive or intensive. And here's what you think. You say, okay, we're looking at mass. What if the paper was bigger? What if my sample of paper was larger? Do you think there is a mass difference between these two samples? Yes. When the sample size changes, the mass changes, meaning mass is extensive. Mass is an extensive property because it changes if the sample changes, the size of it. I, in, I mean, in your example, the mass wouldn't change by balling it up, but by changing the sample size, that would change it. Oh, you mean this? Yeah, so balling it up would not be extensive. I see what you're saying. That would not be extensive. So then what's an example of the other category? All right, well, let's look at him again. Let's choose a different description. Here we go. This time I'm going to describe its color. What color is the paper? Yellow. Yellow. Ready? Ready? Here we go. Here we go. What color is that big paper? Yellow. Color is intensive because if the size of the sample changes, the color doesn't. Mass. This one takes practice to get good at, so Schoology will give that to you, but let's draw a couple cards just for fun. Your choices are extensive or intensive. Are you ready? Here we go. Let's go over to cluster six and talk to seat one. Six one, you and me, here we go. Everybody else quiet. The amount of sugar in a candy bar. The guess is extensive, what do you think? Now, here's the way to think about it. You say, okay, well, what if I had a small candy bar, like a bite-sized Butterfinger, and I compare it to a king-sized Butterfinger? Would there be a different amount of sugar in those two sizes? Yeah. Yes, for sure, right? Ask anyone with diabetes. You can't eat, they can't have the big one, right? Um, amount of sugar in a candy bar, the amount of energy in a candy bar is extensive. Let's do another one. Are we going to do another extensive one to trick us or let's get switched over? Let's find out. Here we go. Let's go over to cluster five. We are really hanging out in the back of the room today. Cluster five, seat four is Aspen. Ready? The boiling point of water. The guess is intensive. Do you agree or disagree? That's correct. The boiling point of water is constant. Do you see how... Well, here, let me ask you this. What is the boiling point of water? What was it? No. Well, it's 100 Celsius, but which is good. I like Celsius better. Yep. What is it in Fahrenheit? 212. Yeah, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Do you see how to answer that question? <coughs> you don't have to ask me, well, sir, how much water do you have? Because it doesn't matter how much water you have, right? The boiling point, melting point, freezing point, those items are constant no matter what the size is. That's called a colligative property actually, but talking about a sample of water compared to a larger sample of the same water. Yeah? Let's end with one more idea and then I'm gonna cut you loose. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're killing it, y'all. Um, write down that word up there, volatility. Write down the word volatility, let me show you. You're famous. All right, let's talk about what is volatility. Write this down. Volatility means 
matter that evaporates quickly. Something that's volatile is matter that evaporates quickly. We've been doing it the entire period. Let's talk about things that evaporate quickly. What, what if I dumped out a big bucket of water on the ground? Do you think water is volatile? Uh, yeah, I'm not talking about whether something will evaporate. I'm talking about does it evaporate fast? If I were to dump out the water on the floor and we were to wait a class period, the floor would still be wet after that class period. All right. So water is not very volatile. Let me show you something that is volatile. This is ethanol. All right, anybody know where you find ethanol? All right, well, it's found in lots of places, but um, it, it helps you get to school today in what? Yeah, in gasoline. Hey, just a side note, it is ethanol. What does it look like, though? Yeah, it looks like water. So here's a good side note for the class. I have a ton of stuff that looks like water that will put you in the hospital. So never make assumptions when you see my chemicals. Ethanol is volatile. The way I know that, if I were to pour this ethanol out on the desk like this, it's not going to last long. All right? Before the bell rings it'll all evaporate because ethanol is an example of something that's very volatile. Now, little side note on ethanol though, or on things that are volatile, volatile items are also usually quite reactive. You only need to input a tiny bit of energy and you can get them to come right to life. Very easy. Volatile items evaporate quickly, but they also ignite and react very quickly. Y'all have a good weekend.